Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is recognising and developing opportunities. And there's two amazing facets to this. One is it's so simple to do. To go out there and recognise and realise opportunities is easy. It involves a bit of hard work, but it's pretty simple. It's not rocket science. The amazing thing, second amazing thing is so few people do it. So few people will just keep doing the same thing over and over, getting the same results or lack of results, but they just keep doing it. And I've got to be honest, as a business coach, you sit there frustrated sometimes. You just want to grab people and say, please, you've got to do this. But they don't. So you may think some of this stuff is fairly basic that we're going to run through, but I really want you to think about how much of this you're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're going to be looking at recognising opportunities. Where and how do I find new business? And that's what is keeping a business afloat and sustainable. You have to be finding new business all the time, no matter what industry, market or sector you are in. Then how do I convert these opportunities into revenue? That's what we need to work out. And we're going to talk about all different types of communication styles, the different manners that we go and we sell and we market the companies. Now, it's interesting, there'll probably be some people in here talking a lot about social media and websites and so on. All of this stuff still applies. It is still fundamental sales skills that people need to employ, no matter what media or format that you're using. You've got to know who you're talking to and how they receive their messages. What's going to make them click, or possibly not click, and stay on your page a little bit longer? Might be a better way of putting it. And then finally, as we go through, we're going to talk about some tools and tips just to keep you on track. Because there's also an element to this where we go out and we do all the hard work, but things start to fall through the cracks. I would like to think we're all busy people, uh, but things do happen to fall through the cracks if we don't have a process to support what we're doing and have that process in place. And some of the issues we typically face, and you know, show of hands here, Sales often are an afterthought. I know of a lot of companies where I go in and I say, let's talk about your sales, and it's really the stuff they do on a Friday afternoon. I'll make a couple of phone calls, I'll send a few emails, I'll update the, uh, the Facebook page. There is really no program, no process in place. It's really there as an afterthought. And often we'll get distracted from it. There's plenty of distractions we have in business on a daily basis but often we will just get distracted from what we're doing. Therefore, we end up as being totally reactive. If you're going to run a successful business, you have to be on the front foot all the time. You must be proactive. What's that mean? That means having a plan. That means sticking to the plan. That means measuring how you're going against the plan and then making changes. You must keep making changes to what you're doing. You've got to keep ahead of the curve on all these things. Because if you don't, how many people have uh, heard of Sisyphus? And it's not something I picked up in Bangkok a couple of years ago. Sisyphus? Sorry? It's the name of your table, exactly right. <laughs> Sisyphus was a, a Greek god, a Greek king, sorry, and in a moment of hubris, he suggested to a few people that he was a bit more powerful and a bit more uh, clever than the gods were. So the gods gave him a task. They said, we want you to roll this boulder up this mountain when you get to the top, great, well done. Sounds a bit like our sales, doesn't it? A bit like our business development, pushing a boulder up a very steep hill. But what the gods had in mind for him was that whenever he got about one foot from the top of the hill, the boulder would roll back down. And he would have to trudge back down, and he would push it back up, he'd get a foot from the, from the apex, from the pinnacle, and it would roll back down again. And that's what a lot of us do in sales and marketing for our business. We keep rolling that boulder up the hill, we think we've got to a point and then it just rolls back down again. It all unravels and you come along to these things and you pick up hints and tips and you go away with the best intentions, but we get distracted and we end up right at the coal face, just not really doing anything about our sales and marketing other than perhaps saying, oh, I've got a website. Well, great. When I first started my consulting back here in, in Perth in 2008, I had a website too. And like most people, I had it designed, I had it published, I had it put up. I sat back with my feet on the table waiting for the phone to ring. In all those years, I've had three websites, and I think I've got one inquiry off the website. 
Now, that's not a slight against uh, social media or the electronic media, but it's certainly a slight about the effort I was putting in, because I published them and left them there. Didn't do any work on them whatsoever. But we do the same thing with other media and formats. The secret to recognising opportunities? Work out what business you're in. Now, that may seem pretty simple, possibly even a bit dumb, but work out what business you are in. And often I will go into a client and they'll be saying, oh, we make these. And they might be saying, you know, we make uh, motor bodies for trucks. Yeah, OK, that's part of the business you're in, but you're actually in the pressed steel, the pressed metal industry. So you can think about so many things outside of what you're currently doing that could be a new opportunity for you. What and where is your market? Think about where your market is. That's a critical one because sometimes we don't speak to the right people in our market. We try and sell and market to the wrong people. By that, I mean drilling down. You know, when one of those jobs I had, many jobs I had up in Singapore with British Aluminium, we used to sell um, C-sized gas cylinders, which were the, the standard black and white oxygen cylinders that you see in hospitals. And we used to sell them to a gas company. And I used to go along and I used to sell and market to the gas company. Then I found out that the gas company was actually selling them to medical supply companies. The medical supply companies were then selling them to the hospitals or leasing them to the hospitals. Who was the end user? Patients, hospital staff. So we went and started talking to them about what were some of the issues you're facing with the cylinders. The gas company didn't give a rat. But when you started to talk to the nurses and they say, oh, your handles are a bit too small, we can't get our hands in, et cetera, et cetera, we made bigger handles, our sales just took off. So it's about going in and drilling down into the market that you're serving and making sure you're talking to the right people and giving them the right messages. And then how or where do we connect? You do it through events like this. Um, but you've got to find out where that market is and how to connect with them. That's the where. Okay? Don't go fishing in a brackish pond, is what they'll say. Find out where your market really does circulate. Okay? If you're selling something like industrial pumps, just per chance, Gary. <laughs> you know? um, find out where that marketplace is, but also drill down into that marketplace. Okay? You might be selling to engineering companies, but go and talk to the mining operations. Talk to people who actually use these things and work on them as well as your, the obvious people in your market. And then where you can, you apply your strengths. And a lot of us don't do that. A lot of us have really innate strengths that we have in business. But because we've chosen a particular profession, we'll sometimes sit on those strengths and we won't use them. So think about what the strengths are, your core strengths. A lot of those strengths will come from your passions. If you're passionate about something and you choose to have that as an innate strength and you can build and build on it, you'll be a lot more successful than thinking, because I'm in this industry, I have to behave and react this way. Think about your core strengths. Think about those passions that you have. How can I help these clients? It's one of the things, and I, I talk about it later, is I got asked once to... Uh, put together a sales program for a major company and the woman that I was negotiating with, <coughs> pardon me, she said, how long have you been in sales? And I said, about 35 years. And she said, why do you love selling so much? I said, well, I don't. I think selling sucks. I really don't like selling. How many people here like to be sold to? Oddly enough, oh, Chris does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a salesman. <laughs> but I don't like being sold to. I don't like the phone calls at dinner time, asking about how my car insurance is. And if they'd ever seen how I drive, they probably wouldn't even touch me with a barge pole. But, you know, I take the approach. When I go in, it's always, and again, this sounds incredibly naff, how can I help? It's not about selling to people. It's about helping people. You know, finding 10 engineers by Monday, that's a huge call. But if you can do that and you help your client and you continually do that, 
you'll end up shutting out the opposition because they'll just keep coming to you because they know you help. Remember when we use that word, it's very empathetic, isn't it? I'm helping you. And they will start to see this as a relationship, one would hope. And then sell them what they need, not what you have. And you'll see I've put a little reminder there for myself about Indonesia 1988. Uh, I went into Singapore in 1988 to run four countries for Castrol. And when I took over the business, our sales at the time were $2.8 million. Not that impressive. Uh, and we were manufacturing in Singapore all of these fantastic products that the UK was sending us. They were sending us the formulations. They would send experts out from the UK to run the first trial batches and then run the first field trials for us, give us feedback, because raw materials vary with geography, so they would have to tinker with the formulation. Yeah, and we were, we were doing OK, $2.8 million. I then noticed that the marketplace didn't really want all our technology. The marketplace actually was a little bit behind what we were doing in Europe at the time. So I went along and started asking the clients, what is it you really want? And what came out was that they wanted the products that Castrol had made about 20 years ago. So I went back to the UK and said, can you dig out some formulations from the late 60s, early 70s and send them over? We started manufacturing those products. Within 18 months, we'd gone from 2.8 million to 6.3 million. And people couldn't believe When they'd say, where's the growth come from? And I started describing some of the products. They looked at me like I was crazy. But it was simply giving the market what it wanted, not what I have. We've always got to remember that. Again, it goes back to that getting pigeonholed. You're always thinking, oh, I'm in this business, therefore I've got to provide this. Go back and think, what is it the client wants? That's the critical thing. Often, we only have one product or service. So a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I do mortgage settlement. That's it. Bang. That's my role. That's my job. But you've got to think about other markets you can approach. Start to think about, remember what I said, what is it I actually do? I facilitate financial transactions. So start to think outside the box a little bit. Maybe there's something else that I can do in conjunction with that field. Again, think about the issues that they have. We will often just find something that works and we'll stick with it. Think about other issues. Go and talk to them and say, what are some of the issues? And you never know, you might end up becoming a market disruptor. You might be the next Uber of mortgage settlement agents. Okay? Just, but keep talking to the market. It's critical that you do that all the time. And then think about the manner in which you approach them. And that can be in your language that you use, but also about the fact that you're here to help. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to help. Talk to me about any issues that you've got. Back in the, uh, I think it was late 60s, early 70s, there was a Professor Mahabrim at UCLA. And he did a study on the power of language and communication. And he came up with this fantastic rule. He got all these people at UCLA to do many hundreds, perhaps thousands of presentations. And then he got people to fill in forms about the power of those and the effectiveness of those presentations and what it was that resonated or had an impact on the audience. And he broke them into three groups. He broke them into the words, the content. So the words that you have, the words that you say. He then broke it into the verbal. It's how you say these things, the tone, the pace, pause. When I coach presentation skills, we often say silence is the, the one that speaks loudest. And if you're talking to a client, often, Silence is the one. Don't jump in with offered solutions. Let them keep talking all the time. Okay? He also introduced or said, what about nonverbal? So things like gestures, eye contact. Eye contact is the big one. You know, you've heard the expression, you couldn't look me in the face. The eyes are the windows to the soul. It's very important when you're trying to connect with people, and hopefully I'm doing that by looking around the room and practicing what I preach. Um, You've got to have good, strong eye contact with your clients. Remember, it's also culturally sensitive. In Thailand, you cannot hold eye contact for as long as you can, say, in Australia. But 
what was the impact of, out of 100%, what was the impact of the actual content, the words? Any guesses? 20? 15? We're getting there. <laughs> Eight. Oh, the lucky number. Eight. Seven. Seven percent. And this is where a lot of marketing material falls down. And this is why my websites fell down, because I put a lot of words on there. And mine, mine were very word rich. They were very wordy. The more words I put up there, the better it was. But totally wrong. Because words by themselves only carry, according to these studies, 7% impact. But then you add the voice. What do you reckon the voice would add to that? What's the voice out of 100%? Your tone, your speed. 20? Any advance on 20? Do we hear 20? I've got 20. 70. 70. Got 70 over there. Got 70. Got 70. <laughs> Have we got a bit online? No, we haven't got a bit online. <laughs> it's actually. Yep. 33%. And in fact, that's wrong, it's 38%. That number's wrong. So it's 38%. So if you're using the right words and you're using your voice in a powerful, effective way, you're looking at 45%, not 40%. Okay? Then you start to use nonverbal. It adds another 58%. Say if we're doing a, a radio broadcast where there's no real connection, it's a, a disconnect between the two. But you're right, once you do the verbal and the face-to-face, -face, you can see the power that you deliver. So this is why events like this are more powerful than just, you know, we could have just given you a transcript of this. And you might look through it and think, wow, OK, yeah, that's good. But it would have been less than 10% more effective, apparently, than if we do it this way. But, and this is why now websites you know, they're, they're talking now about all this marketing, electronic marketing, social media, etc. It's about getting videos up there. So gone are the days where it was just words, then it was words and pictures, and now it's video. It's driving. Video is driving all the way through the social media. So where do we connect? We can do things like our CRM. How many people here run a CRM? Brilliant. Oh, well, oh, gee. District 32 have a CRM. Well done. We find it's one of the richest sources of new business is our CRM. You've got to keep going back through that and keep mining it. When I got involved with Priority, which was only January, started January this year, uh, I had a guy come out. We use uh, Dynamics 365, part of the, the Microsoft 365 package. And the guy came out and I, I said, I want to know whether this is the right CRM for our business and I want to know whether we're using it the right way and you know, what we can get out of it. So he came over and he asked us, he said, so what do you actually use the CRM for? And I said, oh, well, we track all our communication, all our correspondence. Our emails automatically can track from Outlook into there. When we make a phone call, we can write down the transcript of the phone call. We can say left a message. We can put new contacts in there and da-da-da-da-da. What he said to me, was what I feared. He said, so actually you're using your CRM as an electronic Rolodex. And that's all we were. We were putting everything we did in the business into the CRM. But what weren't we doing? We weren't taking stuff out. We weren't using that. That is a gold mine of information about our clients, conversations we've had. Uh, objections they've had, conflict we've had, success we've had, we don't use it. We just sit there and think, great, our database has got 46,000 people in it. Tick. We will forever be successful. Wrong. You've got to go in there and use that information. Get in there and mine through the CRM. Mem, websites. These days a business has to have a website to exist or be credible. It is a basic fact. Okay. We can use it for commercial reasons, but we, generally we use it to get some credibility. So we've got to make sure that we've got a good quality website up there. We can do email campaigning. What's the problem with email campaigning? <laughs> Getting people to open it. And when they open it, what do they often see a lot of? Words. 
What did we say about words on their own? Dean? <laughs> it's only about 7% effective. Now, you could have a great story, and that might blow those numbers out of the water, but rarely does it happen. The most common thing, I, I get so many emails, and I'm sure we all do, I'll sometimes delete them after I've read the subject line. Because okay. I'm sure those pills don't work. But <laughs> I, well, the ones I tried didn't. But they <laughs> got one caught in my shoe and made me limp. Um, and then we can do advertising as well. But again, when you look at advertising, the real force is things like video, okay? getting onto television. If you can't be on TV, be on radio, where you can use two elements of communication. Social media. Now, there's a lot to be said for using social media, but it's, again, it's got to be done effectively, and it's got to be maintained. I kicked myself, because when I started at Priority back in January, I said, right, let's get a social media calendar together. We're going to map out what we're going to do because we have so much content. We've got testimonials from all around the world. We've got great stuff to put in. And I haven't got round to it yet <laughs> because there's other things to do in the business. So I'm now thinking I'd get someone in to do that for me. And sometimes we've got to do that. Sometimes we've just got to run the white flag up and say, look, I'm too busy. And I'll get someone in to do this for me. And there's no, no crime in that. In fact, your business is going to be better off for it, okay? And then finally, things like District 32. Getting together with like-minded people. And it's, it's so many benefits to actually sitting in a room full of business people. You know, events like this where you can sit and talk to people because we all have problems in our business, but we're not unique. We all share those problems. We all, you know, there's people in here, I might have a massive problem with my business, but I could go down and talk to someone in the room and I'll say, you know what, I'm having exactly the same issues. Or they may say, even better still, I had that issue 12 months ago, this is what I did to fix it. So it's great to talk to people. Get into a forum and just talk to people about your business. And don't necessarily say, oh, you know, I'm going really well. Fess up. Say, I've got a problem with cash flow. I've got a problem with time management. All the surveys we've done, by the way, on small business, small to medium enterprise, they are the two biggest issues people want to talk about. Getting money in and the time to spend on your business. They are the two. We've got a 100% response on cash flow when we put some numbers out and some surveys. We only got about 70% back on time management. And when I followed it up, they all said, I didn't have time to fill it in, sorry, mate. So we sort of were, okay, that's one more for time management. So it's, it's a critical thing. And we've got to make decisions about which one of these forums, which one of these media is best for our business. They've all got strengths and weaknesses, and it's really a case by case. Like, for priority, we have, we've got our website. We've actually got two websites. We've got the Australian one and the international one. But... We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn. I could not see us going on Twitter, for example. I don't think it lends itself to my style of business. And who's going to be sending seven tweets a day? I might have bad hair, but I'm no Donald Trump, all right? I haven't got a department sending my tweets for me. So again, you've got to think about the market that you're going to go after and be honest with yourself about the resource you've got in your business to, to maintain these things. I know there is nothing worse than going onto any form of advertising, social media, whatever you like to call it, and you find that the last post was from 2014. It doesn't give you a lot of confidence in the company that you may be working with. Depends on offering, depends on the market, but it generally, we've still got to support it with some sales effort. Okay. There are businesses out there I know that can survive purely through electronic media. They can put stuff out there, online shopping, for example. Uh, it can just work its way through, and eventually they will start to pick up some, some momentum. They will start to make sales. But generally, you have to support what you're doing from a marketing point of view. 
Marketing alone will not get you over the line. It'll get people interested. Um, it may get you a bit of business, but it won't get relationships being built and sales being continually generated and renewed. Okay. And on this slide, I actually got the numbers right. The 738.55 ratio, you need to tap into that. It needs to interact with one another and it needs to be consistent. I see so many inconsistencies in people's marketing and sales programs. The marketing is going off in this direction, sales is going off in this direction. By that top one there, tapping into it, you've got to make sure that you're using as much of the communication that's available to you. So think about the words, think about the verbal, think about your interaction, your nonverbal gestures, etc. It's critical that you do that. And as they often say, you know, I'm, I'll tell you now, I'm not a social media guru whatsoever. You get a double fist pump from me when I get my phone to charge. I'm absolutely brilliant at getting Apple phones to charge. I'm great at it. When I remember to turn the power on. Um, but you've got to make sure that one of the marketing elements is driving people to the other marketing element. So, you know, you talk about on your Facebook page about your new website, et cetera, et cetera. So that you're always driving it internally, making people look more at your business than anywhere else. But at networking, you apply all aspects of interaction. So we use words, we use the voice, and we use gestures. You can see immediately which me me sorry, messages resonate. You know, we do an email campaign, and we still do those. We still give them a shot every now and then. But it's probably a couple of weeks before you can sit down and draw any conclusions about whether it's been successful or not. You might get one or two inquiries coming in. You may convert a couple of those inquiries. But there's a time lag. When you're talking to people face to face, and this just goes for networking and talking to clients, you'll soon see that whether your message is resonating or not a hell of a lot quicker than any other other way that there's, there is around. And it also lets you practice your patter. So by that, you start to understand the issues that are facing your clients. And you can practice what I'm going to be saying for someone who's got that issue. And what we used to coach people was that we would go in there and there'd be several issues that would typically come up from the people we're approaching. And we would say, if they say this, you say this. But it wasn't learning by rote. It was just getting people used to the fact that they will be, there will be issues coming up and there's a solution that you can potentially have for it. So it gives you various exposure to various opportunities and potential issues, as we talked about. The opportunity to increase the size of your living sales team. That is a critical thing. When you're talking at, at places like this, Think about the fact that you're talking to not only other business people in the room, but potentially you could be turning these people into an advocate. They could be going out and saying, oh, just heard the best thing ever. And they go out and they start selling your, you and your product to people. So you get the opportunity to expand your, your uh, sales team by magnitudes. It's a critical thing. You really want people to be out there selling for you. Because as we say there, relationships it equals advocates. If you've got a good, strong relationship with people, I mean, how many people here always buy the cheapest product? Thank God for that. <laughs> no one. And we will often make decisions based purely on relationships. I'm getting some printing done. Any printers in the room? Good. That's another good thing. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got four quotes put out. My mates came in. He was the second cheapest. And... Uh, I'll probably give it to him because I've got a relationship with him. But again, I got the quotes. We went through the process. But we all do that. You think about it. If you can build relationships, that's when you start to really get your sales, getting traction and moving on. So realising opportunities is where the marketing input and the sales input combine to realise these opportunities. Points raised in this selling component have real value in the marketing realm as well. So what we're going to talk about in sales applies to marketing when you're talking about communication and getting the message across. However, the first step is grow. Back in the 70s, Sir John Whitmore developed this coaching model. And when I do coaching of businesses, this is the model I use called grow. 
And there's a lot of them out there, but this is the one I'm most comfortable with and the one that works for me and works for my clients. Set yourself some goals and objectives. For every single objective and goal that you've got, do a reality check on it. And what you'll find is there's a gap. You then take each of those gaps and think, what are the obstacles? What's stopping me from closing that gap? And what are the opportunities or the options I have to close that gap? Because there'll always be things stopping us. It can be time, it can be money, it can be resources. It, sometimes it can just be contrariness. Just don't really feel like doing it. Okay? I don't have the skills. We'll get the skills. Bring them in. Buy them in. I haven't got the money to do that. Okay, so let's look at another option. And then the final one, and this is the one, remarkably, coaching people, we will fly through those first three. It'll be fantastic. It's fun. You're learning more about your business. You're getting excited. You're forecasting about the future. When we get to the will or the way forward, which is the actual implementation, it grinds to a halt. And I will go in a couple of weeks later and say, so how are we going? Oh, we've had a couple of rough weeks. We've had to do this. We've done this. One of the clients did this. So you've done nothing is what you're telling me. Uh, yeah, we've done nothing. So you go back in a fortnight later. How's it been? Well, it hasn't got any better. So we still doing nothing? We're still doing nothing. So all the time and money they spent with me is just getting up the proverbial wall. So you've got to implement. How many of you guys here have got very clear goals and objectives for your business? Okay. By that, I mean, are they down in writing? Are there revenue projections for your business? Are you doing costs for your business? This is the margin I will be making, therefore this is the profit I'll be making. Because no matter how big your business is, you've got to do that. When I'm running just me, when I just had me in my business, I used to sit down and have budget sessions with myself. Sounds a little bit obscure, but I would sit there and think, right, let's have a look at last year. And, and that's where you go first. You go back to the history of your business and think, right, we did this, 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 break it into months. This is fantastic. Ah, but one of those was an extraordinary one. We picked up that contract. We're not likely to get that, but we're working on this. So you've got to build those goals. Because otherwise, what are you measuring against when you're going out doing your sales and marketing? Probably last year. Okay. But was last year enough? Was that good enough? Think about your personal goals. How much money do I have to take out of this business to lead the lifestyle I want to lead? That's when you start to really generate goals and objectives. Because if you're not in business to look after yourself, your family, and have some fun, then you either should get out of business or find another one to get into. Because otherwise, there's no other reason to be doing it. So you've got to go back and look at those goals and objectives and formalise them, write them down and have them as a measure. And everyone knows this, the old acronym of, of SMART. When you do a goal, and I will tell you now, I've walked into companies and I said, right, have you got your goals and objectives sorted out? Yeah. What is it? We want to be as good as we could be. Great. Or we want to be a lot better than our competition. Fantastic. How do we measure that? How do we sit down and say, right, what do we do? How do we, how do we achieve this? So it's got to be smart. It's got to be very specific. It's got to be measurable. It's got to be attainable. It's got to be relevant to the business you're in. And you must have time scales on there. You must have milestones. Now, the one thing I will guarantee, the first time you go through this exercise, you will be incredibly optimistic. You'll be as optimistic as me when Carlton the plane on the weekend, on a Friday, Friday afternoon, I get incredibly optimistic. I think, this is the weekend. We're going to do it this weekend. And I wake up Monday and I'm bankrupt again. I'm pessimistic. Okay? You get optimistic with your milestones when you first start because you think, oh, I can do this, and I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. But then facts and the real life get in the way and things start to slow back. Be a little bit pessimistic with your milestones because otherwise you, you start to get demotivated. You start to miss milestones early on. You think, oh, this is too hard. I can't do it. All right?
what I do, I sit down, I work out all the milestones, and then I double them. So if I say, oh, I've got to get that done in the first week, I double it. I'll say, that'll take two weeks to do. So I, I push the milestones out, and I push them out by double that. Interestingly, though, um, again, it depends. I can talk about other companies I've worked with. Even when we've done that, we've missed the first few because you're relying on other people, sometimes outside the organisation, to do things for you. And it's like I used to, with British Aluminium, I had to go around 14 countries and operations, and we had to review their P&Ls. And we'd sit down there, and the only answer we wouldn't accept was what? If we said there's, you know, you've said you were going to do 7 million, you're doing 4.5, why? What would be the only answer we wouldn't accept? Don't know. Don't know. Can't tell you. <laughs> now, if you start to miss some milestones and you're saying to yourself, geez, I can't work out why I missed that, then the alarm bell should be ringing. But if we went, we've been into businesses where they're supposed to get 20 million and they were at 12, and we tell you, why? No, what's happened, boys? Well, we lost the China Steel contract, we did this, we had this, new competitors started, bang, bang, bang. And they gave us all those reasons. We then had the ammunition to say, right, this is now what you've got to do for the business. You've got to change this, do this, do this, do this. But I don't know, just doesn't, yeah, doesn't cop it. And the same should be when you're talking about your own business. If you're sitting there in the bath one morning, as I do every morning with my book, <laughs> and I st start reading, but I drift off and I start to think about work, and I'm, something's not quite working out, I never say to myself, I don't know. In here, I really know what the reason is. But if it's something external, I go and find out. I don't sit there and say, well, I'm going to accept, I don't know. As soon as you start accepting internal mediocrity, you're on a slippery slope. Okay? Because if you aim at nothing, you get it at every time. I can tell you guys that about two or three years ago, my business was like that. It was teetering. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go out and get a job. Ugh, horrible. <laughs> because why would I do that? I'm enjoying myself. I wasn't, I'd stop measuring the business. I'd stop actually challenging myself. And it's really hard when you're the only person in the business to keep challenging yourself. Say, well, what are my goals? What am, I, what, am I doing the right thing? Am I working towards it? It's tough. You've got no one to bounce ideas off, which again is why a forum like this is valuable. Okay? So a couple of questions you should always ask yourself. Is your business now at the stage where you envisaged it would go or be? Just think about that one. These are the two questions I often ask clients when I'm first going in and they say, we want to grow our business. I went into one the other day. Uh, we're currently at 6 point, I think 6.4 million, and in five years we want to be at 14 million. So I want to double a bit, so 15% compound growth over five years. And you say, okay. Where did that number come from is always the first question I ask. Because we have a lot of people who are doing three, four hundred thousand dollar businesses and they say, I want to be a million dollar business. Why? Well, then I can join District 32, seven figure CEOs and stuff like that. So they, they come up with some really profound numbers and you say, but why? Because don't forget what goes up. As your revenue goes up, costs go up, invariably stress goes up as well. So you've just got to think about this. Is it at the stage now where you envisaged it would be? And then if you sit there and say, I don't know, or no, it's not, but I'm not sure why, then it's time to do some real soul searching. But the other one, and this is the one that usually gets the best response from, from people, is I'll often walk in and say, if you were starting your business again on Monday, how different would it look to what you have now? Because businesses are a growing thing. They're organic. And we will tack things on. We might see something that's bright and shiny and we'll pull it in and we'll put it into our business. You know, it could be software, it could be an app, it could be a website, it could be whatever. We'll grab that and we'll pull that in. That looks like a good idea. I'm having some of that. We'll pull that in, pull that in, pull that in. And what we end up doing there, and I'll include in there, one that Lorraine and I have spoken about a few times, strategic partners who will say, oh, I really want to work with you. I think we could do some great things together. 
I must have gone through about 10 or 12 strategic partners in my career. And what the definition of strategic partner is, they wait for you to develop all the ideas, they wait for you to pay all the costs, and then they sit back and they take the revenue. That's a strategic partner in my opinion. So all of these things, you start to lose focus. And focus is one of the most critical things you can have in business. And if you start getting diverted away from what you're really trying to achieve, and because you've got all these distractions, all these things you've added into the business, you've got to go through and get rid of all that dead wood. And think about yourself. Michael, get up Monday morning. Is this the way I wanted this business to look? Is this the values? Is this the image I wanted to have? Are these the results I'm getting? And if it's not, you've got to sit down and analyse why not? Why am I not getting these results? And you might have to do just a little tweak to get it right, or you may have to go through and flamethrower the place. All right? So it's an important question to ask yourself. But often we'll find goals are not achieved because set and forget. Okay, Chris said it's a great idea if I go away and do some goals and objectives. Done that. Now, where's the archive file? I'll put them in there, and I'll come back and review them in 12 months' time. We set and we forget. We set unachievable goals. I've had clients that, when they've put their goals in front of me and said, I want to be a half a million dollar business, for example, and then we break it down and say, well, that means you've got to fit 50 of these units to motor vehicles a day. How many people have you got working for you? Oh, it's just me. <laughs> well, you know that's physically impossible, mate. You can't do that. Oh, OK. Well, I'll have to get someone else in. Oh, no, mate, you have 10 more blokes in. <laughs> What's that got to do to your cost structure? What's it got to do to your profitability? People don't think this through. They, and I'm serious. They just think, oh, I'll pick a number. And away we go. Completely unattainable, unachievable. Then they'll have goal slip. And we might have a couple of really good uh, months. But then it starts to go downhill a bit. So I'll start making excuses about the goals and objectives. Yeah, I was a bit over the top when I, you know, I've been drinking and smoking a bit when I did that and had the bean bag out in the blue room and picked a number and all this. So you start to let yourself down a bit, OK? If you're working for a team, and sometimes this happens as an individual, there's no buy-in. And it was one of the things at Castrol that everyone contributed to developing the budgets and the forecasts and the goals. So they'll develop from the bottom up. Okay. So you've got to make sure if you've got a team in your business and you are doing goals and objectives, sales goals and objectives, make sure you get them to buy in. And most importantly, down there, they've got to be achievement-based rather than a measure of activity. <laughs> 